Lynn, Senior Editor of American Scientist, and we're here for the next in our series of Google Hangouts with distinguished lecturers, Sigma Xi distinguished lecturers. Um, we will have other Hangouts in the future. Please check the Google Plus page for the schedule of those. Uh, this Hangout is with Todd Suravel, Professor and Director of the George C. Frieson Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of Wyoming. And this Hangout is sponsored by the Research Triangle Park chapter of Sigma Xi. So thank you very much for that, RTP chapter. Um, people watching can send in questions by typing them in to the sidebar at the right. And we'll also be live tweeting this Hangout. You can follow along or join in with your tweets at hashtag AmSciGHO. And Sigma Xi members can go to the community page after this Hangout if you have follow-up questions um, or questions you didn't have time to send in during the actual Hangout. So. Professor Suravel, thank you very much for joining us. We're happy to be talking with you today. Um, I understand you just got back from Mongolia. Would you tell us a little about what you were doing there? Uh, happily. Thanks for having me, and thanks uh, to everybody who's joining us. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been working in Mongolia since 2012. I'm an archaeologist. Um, uh, my expertise is in the first people of the New World, uh, and I normally work in, in the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. Um, but in Mongolia, I'm actually, uh, I've changed gears and I'm working with living people. I'm working with a group of people called the Doha, who are reindeer herders who live in far northern Mongolia. And the research I'm doing there is called ethnoarchaeology which is the study of living people for the purpose of developing tools uh, for interpreting the archaeological record. Is that a fairly new sub-branch of archaeology? Uh, not really. The first ethno-archaeological studies, um, sort of formal ethno-archaeological studies, were done in the 1970s. Um, of course, archaeologists have been have been looking to native or indigenous peoples for a long time um, to do things like make analogies between technologies that we find in the archaeological record and things that we have observed people doing, either in the modern or historic time periods. I see. Uh, so tell us a little about the people you have just been studying in Mongolia. So they're called the Doha, that's, that's what they call themselves. The Mongolians call them Satin. Um, they are relatively recent migrants to Mongolia. They, they moved to Mongolia in the 1950s um, from, uh, from Russian Siberia. Um, and uh, they have domestic reindeer. The, the herders, the pastoralists, the reindeer they have are domesticated. They ride them, they pack with them, they milk them. I um, use them for food and for hide and for antler. And the reason why I wanted to study them is because the people I study in, in prehistory were nomadic uh, hunter-gatherers. I lived in a cool, temperate environment. And I had some questions about how people use space in nomadic contexts. And I wanted to find a group of nomadic peoples today uh, who, who retained a somewhat traditional nomadic lifestyle and lived in a similar environment. And there really aren't a lot of people in the modern world that meet that description. Um, and, and that's how I ended up in Northern Mongolia. That makes sense. I see that uh, you've mentioned in your background material that the Doha move two to eight times per year. What, what, are, the, what are some of the reasons that they would move from one location to another? Well, you know, uh, as pastoralists or herding peoples, um, the primary concern is finding, uh, is grazing their animals and making sure their animals have enough forage. Uh, so they can only forage in, in one location for so long. So that would be the primary impetus for moving. Um, from season to season, it, it depends a little bit. In the summer, they're up in the high alpine uh, tundra where abundant forage for the reindeer 
is available and they can stay in summer camp for as long as three months. As fall comes and the weather changes and the forage starts to run out, they, they move down an elevation down essentially to tree line um, where, where the forage uh, uh, is better, the weather's better, it's a little warmer, there's less snow and then they keep moving down and down and down. Uh, they move down again in the winter and then start coming back up in the spring and in the summer. The other primary reason why, why people move um, is between the taiga and town. And some families only move twice per year. And those families, uh, they herd in the summer, but during other seasons, uh, they head to the nearest town, which is called Saganora. It's about 30 miles away. Particularly, that's true of families of school-aged children who have kids who have to go to school. So they'll move to town um, while the kids go to school and they'll, they'll leave their animals for others to tend during that time period. Uh, wolf predation is another reason why I've seen families move. Um, when I was there in the fall of 2014, one family lost six animals to wolves. So they, they moved about 30 kilometers away to another valley to try to, to, to move away from the areas where the wolves were active. Hmm. And what sort of dwellings do they live in? So for most of the year, they live in, in uh, what they call an or orts, O-R-T-Z is, would be the best English spelling. Um, we would recognize it as a teepee. It's a conical lodge. It has a frame with typically 28 to 40 uh, lodge poles made of, of larch. Uh, and then it's covered with typically four or five pieces of canvas. Um, and it's adjustable in size. It has a, a vent in the top. It has a wood burning stove, a sheet metal stove in the center. Um, in the winter time, because the temperatures are so extreme, so cold, uh, they move out of the taiga down to the edge of the taiga and live in a traditional Mongolian gear or yurt, um, which is much better insulated and, and much warmer. Okay, and about how many people uh, would, would live in an orts? Is it a family group usually? Yeah, exactly. It's typically a family group. Um, I've seen as few as one in the case of a, of a single man, and I've seen as many as nine living um, in an orts. Uh, for special occasions, I've seen considerably more than that inside of an orts. For example, I attended a wedding in 2012 mm. in Taiga. I did not count the people, but uh, there were at least 30 people inside of this orx. It was about eight meters in diameter. It was an especially large one, but we had a lot of people in there. I could imagine that that could get pretty crowded. Um, and I think I saw somewhere in your notes that most of the time the orx has solar power. How does that work? Yeah, in fact, it's quite common for nomadic peoples in in Mongolia to use solar power. Um, one thing that, that's, that struck me, you know, given some of the resistance to green energy in America, in Mongolia, nobody hesitates to use it and it's really their only option. So the, the way it works uh, for the Doha and for other Mongolian nomadic peoples is you buy solar panels and you buy a big um, battery pack. Essentially it looks like a big car battery. And during the day, um, you, put, you put the solar panels out outside of your house, you face them south. During the day, the battery gets charged, and at night, you use that, that charged battery for various purposes. The primary purposes uh, or the primary needs for electricity are lighting um, and, and, and some households television. Okay. And um, so they just set up the solar panels on the, on the ground near... Yeah. Typically, typically, typically the, they will um, put a big log out on the ground and lean it up against the log. Some families will sort of track the sun with the solar panel as the sun moves across the sky. They're big solar panels. I mean, they're not huge. They're big enough. Everything that the Doha have has to be packed on, on reindeer. So when they pick up and move camp, of course, they pack the solar panel. They pack the battery pack. They pack the television. They pack the satellite dish. They pack it all on reindeer. Is there some typical ratio of uh, number of reindeer per person? Um, do they yeah. have huge herds of reindeer, small? I 
Uh, it, it, it really varies dramatically um, depending upon the family. So uh, the reindeer are, are owned by, by each family and, and they're marked. They have individual marks. Uh, that uh, Every family has a mark, like a brand that's on the animal, except it's not burned under the skin. It's, they cut it into the fur with scissors. It has to be renewed frequently. Mm. In terms of numbers of reindeer, um, one family had as few as eight. Another family had as many as 150. It averages about 30 uh, animals per family. That's not a big number. Um, it, it means that reindeer are killed for meat very sparingly. Uh, at most, uh, you know, on average, I would say one or two animals per year uh, because they can't afford more than that. Mm. Okay. Um, well, now that we have some mental picture of how these people are living and traveling as nomads, tell us a little about how you studied their use of space. Well, let me start by saying why it matters and, and how I got interested in this yes. problem. Um, I'm an archaeologist, so normally, you know, I, I excavate archaeological sites. And f uh, for about 10 years, in the late 90s to the mid-2000s, I was working on an archaeological site in Colorado near the town of Kremlin, um, dating to the end of the last ice age. Around, it's about 12,000 years old, and it's a winter campsite where a group of hunter-gatherers, bison hunters, spent the winter. Uh, and they spent quite a bit of time there, probably uh, at least a month, maybe as many as three, three months, because of that, the site was absolutely loaded with stuff. We dug large areas and we recovered something like 75,000 artifacts. And our real focus at the site was trying to understand the spatial organization of the site, how is space being used, and also the social organization of the site. And our only way of doing this was looking at the spatial distribution of stone tools and spatial patterns um, that were evident uh, in different kinds of stone tools. And what I very quickly realized um, after spending many, many, many hours analyzing these spatial patterns and stone tools was that it was easy to identify patterns, but they were difficult to explain. And I'll give you one, one simple example. So at this, at this site in Colorado, we were able to identify households. Um, it's no surprise that people 12,000 years ago and living in the wintertime in Colorado were using households, but they can be difficult to identify because they generally don't leave uh, much of a trace. Inside these households, there's some really interesting patterns in, in the distribution of stone tools. For example, in, in the three households we identified, um, we found that, that stone tools were preferentially concentrated in one area of the house, typically on the back side of the house away from the door. Um, and, and somewhat close to the heart feature in the center of the house. And it inspired in me some very simple questions, which, for example, if you were living in a nomadic context in a small um, circular house, say like a TV, and you were making and using stone tools, where would you sit when you were doing that? And, and how would you make that decision? And if you were to repeat that act over and over and over again, um, what would the distribution of locations look like? And understanding really simple questions like that is important because it allows us to understand spatial patterns in the archaeological record. Um, and, and I realized that, that archaeologists and anthropologists had actually invested very little effort into understanding where people do things and how they make those decisions about where they do things. We've been studying architecture for a long time, different forms of houses, where the furniture is arranged, generally speaking, how houses are used, but nobody actually sat down and carefully assessed how people use space in a nomadic context. So what I wanted to do was find a group of nomadic people and study this very carefully. And specifically what I wanted to do was map where people were doing things and map it very precisely, map it very frequently, and, and, and from those data, try to understand how people were making decisions about where to do things, ultimately then to turn the light back on the archaeological record. So in Mongolia, the way we do that, the way we map people in two ways, in outside spaces, in their campsites, we, we do it using a combination of time-lapse photography and photogrammetry. Uh, 
So we take a, a, a camera, a digital SLR, we put it up high on a pole in a weatherproof box, and it takes a photo of the camp every typically two to four minutes, depending on how our batteries are. And then we use software called photogrammetric software that allows us to then take measurements and actually make maps from those images. So we can map the camp and we can map the location of people and their activities. And we can, we can sort of break down how space is used in a very detailed way. In interior spaces, we use a very simple observational mapping technique where we just have a, a diagram on a piece of paper and we record where people are and what they're doing. Um, we've generated thousands of data points, and now we have a much better idea of how spaces like this are used. Did you find a lot of variation from one person, one household to another? The short answer is no. Um, yeah, yes, there is variation. And, and the variation that you see, most of it has to do with how many people are living in that house. You can imagine that if you put five people in a small orts, uh, they're going to take up more space and people are going to get displaced to less optimal areas than if you just have a single person. But if you look at the overall pattern from house to house to house, there are a lot of surprising similarities. And these houses are used in very, very repetitive ways. So you don't have to allow for eccentricity uh, as, as a factor in uh, interpreting, say, an archaeological record. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, individual eccentricities exist, and they always have existed. Um, in the archaeological record, if there is something that we cannot explain that really doesn't fit a pattern, eccentricity or individual oddity, I suppose, is always a, a possible answer. But in my experience, that when we're looking at big patterns in time and space, that, that they usually explained by much broader phenomenon than individual eccentricities, but yes, they do exist. So in some way, I guess you could control for that by studying more households rather than fewer, or uh, even just more individuals, uh, regardless of how many households they were in. Um, That's absolutely right. I mean, we, we have studied, I think, um, 12 households to this point, and we can compare the patterning in all of those. We can even look at the behavior of individuals and see if there's certain individuals who sort of break from the, the expected expected pattern. Uh, we're able to do that. Um, I have not done that. My impression from having collected a lot of these data are that the eccentricities are not playing a huge part in, in governing governing our data, at least in ethnographic case. And there were a couple of patterns I think you you mentioned you found that were pretty self-explanatory once we stop to think about them, that if you're doing work that requires uh, precision, um, you need to have a good source of light. Um, that's, that's right. And one thing I was curious about was that if I remember right, the, the hearth or the, the cooking area was usually over on the east side of the orts? Yeah, so in general, let me address both of those. So um, if you think about, uh, right, it's, not, it's no big surprise that if you're doing something that, that requires precision that you would tend to be in the location that is best lit. Um, what's interesting about that in, the case, in, the, in, the, in this case that I'm studying, the Dohok case, uh, where is the best lit place in a teepee? Well, it's not a simple answer. Uh, it depends, first and foremost, on <laughs> whether the door is open. If the door is open, the area around the door is by far the brightest. If the door is closed, uh, then the area in the center to the back of the house tends to be slightly brighter. And in fact, we've measured the intensity of light in these houses in both cases. What's interesting about that <clears throat> is that the extent to which the door is left open or closed is dependent on the temperature, which is, of course, dependent on seasonality. So now we're starting to understand that there, the distribution of light in these houses is changing as a function of season. And therefore, we think, and we're starting to have good evidence of this, that this distribution of these light, these uh, precision activities or tool-using activities is changing seasonally from the front of the house to the back of the house. 
and archaeologically, there's good reason to believe that that, that might happen as well. Um, so this is potentially giving us um, a new method for determining the season of occupation of archaeological sites. And as I mentioned, in the case of our excavations at the site in Colorado, artifacts are preferentially accumulated in the back of the house, away from the doorways, which may confirm our suspicion that we're dealing with a cold season occupation. Now, the, the kitchen, yeah, in Mongolia, traditionally in Mongolian yurts uh, and in Doha Ortis, the kitchen is on the eastern side of the house, the doorway is to the south. You walk in the door, the kitchen is to your right. So when we look at certain behaviors like cooking, no, it's no surprise that they tend to be found in that area of the house. One thing that did surprise us dramatically, or I shouldn't say dramatically, was it was unexpected, is that even people who aren't cooking, who aren't involved in food preparation, even people who aren't eating preferentially are on the same side of the house, on the eastern side of the house. Now the Doha called this the woman's side of the house. And anthropologists like to say how important cultural rules are, but if you look at where women preferentially hang out, on the women's side of the house. And if you look at where men preferentially hang out, it's on the women's side of the house. So and in what, what sense is there a men's side of the house? Do they sleep on that side or? Well, no, <laughs> they don't sleep on it. It depends. Uh, some men do, some don't. The, the women and men's side thing seems to really mostly apply to equipment and where the equipment is stored, where people's personal belongings are stored. For example, the, the tack for riding weapons, men's clothing, tools are often on the men's side of the house, cooking stuff's on the, on the women's side of the house. But what struck what strikes me about about this this bias to the women's side of the house is everybody seems to be hanging out in or near the kitchen. <laughs> that and, I have to say doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> right, uh, that it. sounds universal to me. Yeah. Well is it? Is it universal? This is a question that that of course after we found everybody's hanging out in the kitchen. And then I thought, geez, that's where everybody hangs out in my house. And then everybody else tells me that's where everybody hangs out in my house. <laughs> I thought, well, I'm going to go look at the literature to see how, if this has been studied. And in fact, to my knowledge, it hasn't been studied before. It's just sort of this anecdotal thing that we all know, hmm. uh, but it's never been documented. Um, so it, wasn't a, it, was, it was a surprise, and then it wasn't a surprise, and then it made me want to explore the, the issue more. So that was... That was an interesting finding. And and just to to remind us, the the cooking isn't done at the same place as the main source of heat for the house, is it? Is yes. is or is it that people are hanging out there partly just because that's the warmest part of the orts? So the the heat source in the orts is a is a collapsible wood stove, it's just in the center of the house. So when you, I, I have not been able to measure the distribution of heat in these houses, but having spent a lot of time in them, I mean, basically it's warm in the center and it's cooler as you, as you move to the edges of the house, as the cool air is diffusing in through the wall. So the kitchen is not the warmest part of the house. It's, it's the inner ring that's the warmest part of the house. Um, so no, I, I really think it has to do with the fact this is the source of the food and if you're closest to it, and you, you get more of it. So people tend to hang out in that area, much like if you put out a bowl of uh, um, chips and guacamole, it tends to be an attractor <laughs> at a party, right? Exactly. Uh, that, said, that said, there are some very clear temperature uh, patterns that we've noticed with respect to temperature. When it's cold outside, on average, people tend to move towards the center of the house. When it's, when it's warm outside, people move towards, towards the edges. Uh, so they're thermoregulating by, by positioning themselves differently in these houses as well. So you would expect to see different patterns of artifacts in an archaeological record depending on what season of the year that site was, was um, inhabited? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, all, all things being equal, yeah, in, in the cold season, uh, I would expect people making and using stone tools to be more closely tethered uh, to a fire and in warmer seasons less tethered. If you think about people making and using stone tools and in that process you're generating 
hundreds, if not thousands of small flakes or chips from making using stone tools, they're going to accumulate at different distances in the fire depending on the season and all likelihood. And our data, we don't have people using stone tools in the modern world, but if, if, if our data would bear out for, for people living in, in the stone age, you would certainly expect that to be the case. In the moving back over to uh, North America now, um, in the archaeological sites that you've studied, do you do you see a lot of the flakes from the stone tool making gathered in a in a small area? Uh, yes and no. Um, you know, one thing that's, that, that's, that's fascinating about this site that I was talking about is that we have these households, uh, or what's left of them, and we have in some of them 25,000 artifacts on, the, on this floor of the house. We do have evidence for cleaning, too. Um, so uh, up against the wall on a couple of areas, we find these dense concentrations of chipstone, where it looks like people have swept the floor and dumped it, dumped it in the corner. But of course, when you sweep, you don't get everything. The small stuff tends to get left behind. So we have this dense scatter of very small flakes throughout, throughout the house and the floor. We also have evidence of people cleaning out the hearth in the center of the house, taking that outside and dumping it around the perimeter of the house, what I call the yard, um, where we have lots of evidence of uh, burned artifacts spread around the perimeter of these houses. So you, you get a little bit of both where you have this dense scattered material where people were working, and then you also have these very dense areas where people, it looks like, swept up and dumped materials inside, up against the wall, and then the, the hearth, the stuff coming out of the hearth in the center, the ash and the burned artifacts in there get dumped on the outside of the house. Hmm. Um, what about where small children would be? Where would you expect them to be in a fairly small enclosed area and what kind of traces would you expect to find of them or perhaps they wouldn't leave traces as small children in an archaeological record? Let me, let me speak to that from a couple of perspectives. In Mongolia, I, mean, I, I have the opportunity to study small children and how they use space. We're talking about infants that typically swaddled in, in Mongolia. They're, they're put to sleep in a cradle board or they're crawling around on the floor. Infants, uh, you know, kids from the age of five to say 12, my impression is that they're constantly on the move and they don't really sit still and they're all over the place, inside and out. Um, archaeologically, uh, in one of the households at this site, we found evidence of children, we think. Um, and the way you do, the way we were able to identify the presence of children is in unskilled flint mapping. So flint mapping means oh. making stone tools. So in this one household, this is during a period of time called the Folsom period, where people made spear points that are beautiful spear points, required incredible amounts of skill to make them. Um, and we have lots of examples of these beautiful spear points in, in this house. But then we have these clunky artifacts that are covered with flint mapping errors. One nice thing about flint mapping is when you make a mistake, it leaves a clear mark on that stone. I think we have five or six that are called bifaces. They kind of look like knives. They're just absolutely covered with errors. We've done experiments to have unskilled flint mappers try to make bifaces. They look just like these bifaces. So we ask ourselves, in what case in the Stone Age would you have individuals who, by the way, make a living by making stone tools but aren't very really good at it. And our answer is almost certainly it's those who are just learning how to do it, it's children. And that's some of the best evidence for children we have in the archaeological record. There, there are other things you can look for too, like toys. Um, oftentimes, um, a strange arrangements of stone. For example, in Mongolia, uh, I documented these really strange alignments of stone where somebody had, had arranged stones in strange patterns in the floodplain, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, so I asked them about it, and I was told, oh, that's kids playing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the equivalent of adult eccentricity. It's uh, kids' yeah. imaginations, yeah. <laughs> so that pattern had some great meaning, meaning for some kid or a couple of kids, but, but not one that's evident in the archaeological record. Um, 
do you do you is it possible to see in the archaeological record evidence of smaller hands um, napping stone? I don't know. Um, it's a tough question. You know, uh, we haven't. I don't know that anybody's done any experiments looking at the relationship between hand size and the products of flint napping. My guess is that. Um, they would not find much of a relationship. But I will tell you this, I had a student who worked on a rock art site in Wyoming where there were a number of handprints left. So people put their hand up against the, the rock and then sprayed pigment all around it, leaving essentially a negative impression of the hand. And she was hardly the first person to do this. In fact, archeologists have been doing this for a hundred years, but by carefully measuring properties of those hands, we can, to some extent, estimate the age and the sex of the individual who made that handprint. And that's one case is where small hands generally means we're dealing with children. Fair enough. Um, can you tell me a little more about the parallels that you're drawing from the Doha in Mongolia and the archaeological records that you've been studying in Wyoming. Are there other aspects in which you're seeing the, the Doha as a, a good model or providing tools for study of the archeological record back in Wyoming? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, let, me, let me say that the, the project is ongoing. We're still very much in the in, in the phase of, of data analysis. But yeah, there are some things that I've realized about how space is used um, that I think are very applicable to the archeological record um, that weren't necessarily evident to me before, although after the fact, they always seem obvious. Um, in general, when we think about, you know, we have to do something and how do we decide um, where we're gonna, the location we're gonna choose to do it. So we, we generally don't give a lot of thought to it, right? But, but I, I think it's generally governed by what I would call asymmetries or things that make certain areas more attractive than others. And that can be something as simple as areas that are closest to, closer to us we're more likely to use than areas that are far away. Areas that are warmer uh, are more likely to use, we're more likely to use in areas that are colder. Um, of course, that depends upon the season. Some places, areas that are shaded are more likely to be used when it's really hot in, in, in spaces that aren't. When we look at exterior spaces in Mongolia, the exterior spaces of these camps, one thing that's really struck me is how little of it's used. Most of the space is empty. It's just used for people to move through, if they move through it at all. The most of the intensive act, outside activity, whether they're chopping wood, uh, or they're butchering, butchering an animal, or they're doing sewing, or they're repairing a chainsaw, tends to happen in a very, very limited range of areas. They typically have favorable properties for doing those activities, whether we're talking about proximity to raw materials or proximity to one's house. The net effect of that archaeologically is that we expect the archaeological record to be very, very clustered, for artifacts to tend to occur in clusters and to be separated by large spaces that are largely devoid of, of artifacts. And that seems to be very much the case, at least later in prehistory. It doesn't seem to be as much the case early in the earliest archaeological sites in the world, hmm. uh, which is an interesting question unto itself. Uh, we have a question that has uh, come in from someone watching. Uh, how will your archaeology work change in the light of what you've learned from studying the Doha? Uh, that's that's a good question. I, you know, um, I, I think it gives me a much greater insight into the meaning of these spatial patterns that, that we've been observing. But what I'm really hoping um, is that you know, when, once we have studied all four seasons um, in the taiga and we really understand how the spatial distribution of human behavior changes seasonally, that now we're going to be able to reconstruct the season of occupation of archaeological sites. And this is a really, really important thing in my opinion. If you think about, it's not as much the case for the Western people living in our controlled environments, but if you think about living in a traditional indigenous lifestyle, 
in a place that's highly seasonal, your way of life changes dramatically from summer to winter. And yet, archaeologically, it can be incredibly difficult to determine the season of occupation of archaeological sites. But if we could, I think we could start to understand new facets of the archaeological record, particularly how human adaptations change from season to season. So what I'm really hoping is that the major product of this research is that a number of sites that archaeologists have already been excavated will now be able to be assigned to a season. And from that, then we're going to be able to study, learn many new things about human adapt how, how human adaptations change from season to season in the past. Hmm. So you would, you would hope that people could go to sites that were considered already uh, well studied and find a, a new layer of meaning by looking at the patterns uh, distribution of the artifacts there? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And there are, there are hundreds of sites that have been very carefully excavated. We have lots of this wonderful data. And I'm just trying to find ways to, to, to pull out new meaning hmm. um, from those data. OK. I'm curious to know what, what drew you into archaeology in the first place and this particular line of investigation in archaeology. Was it something you wondered about when you were nine or 10? Or did it when I, was, when, I, when I was nine or 10, I was obsessed with birds. Ah. I was an avid, avid bird watcher. And I loved, I absolutely loved watching nature documentaries. And when I went to college at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, I was going to be a zoologist. In fact, I majored in, in zoology. I worked with uh, Jack Heilman, an ornithologist there, on Black Cat Chickadee Project. I studied black cat chickadees in the forest in, in Wisconsin one winter, standing out in the snow. <laughs> that turned out to be good training, I guess. <laughs> it did indeed. Uh, and then uh, I took an anthropology class, and, and I was uh, somebody made me aware of the possibility of doing an archaeological field school. And I did this field school, and I went out to western Wisconsin, and we were digging in a, a, a pit house village, a farming village. It's about 1,200 years old on the bluffs of the Mississippi River. And I just found that exercise fascinating. For one, like any field scientist, I love being outside. And um, for another, you're digging up all this cool stuff from a totally different world, right? From a world where people live this very traditional indigenous lifestyle 1,200 years ago, a world that you can hardly imagine. You're touching things that haven't been touched for thousands of years, and you're doing it with all these young people, and it was just an absolute blast. And, um, and by the time I graduated, I had to make this decision, which way did I want to go? Did I want to be a biologist or, or an archaeologist? And ultimately, I chose archaeology. Um, but to some extent, I still consider myself to be a biologist. I still study animals. And they're just two-legged primates who are long since dead for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the two-legged primates you're studying are always living in very close proximity and in dependence on a lot of other animals. So in a sense, you're still studying the whole web of relationships of various animals, no? That is 100% correct. Yeah, I mean, humans, we like to think of ourselves as existing outside of, the, of an ecosystem, but we're very much part of it, and increasingly we become drivers of major patterns in that ecosystem. Yes. And another major facet of my work, indeed, has been the study of human inter interactions with uh, past animal populations. Mm. Yes, um, you, I, I know, have given some time to looking at the reasons, the possible reasons for extinction of the mammoth in Wyoming. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, not just the mammoth in Wyoming, but, you know, mammoths and their relatives, mastodons and gonfathiers and, and elephants, a million years ago lived all over the world. And in North America, we had a huge array of large mammals that suffered extinction around 13,000 years ago. And can you tell us <laughs> very briefly, can you run through the reasons that have been given, the popular reasons um, for their extinction and, and where you've come down 
uh, in, in choosing among these reasons? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, 13,000 years ago in North America, we lost mammoths, horses, camels, giant ground sloths, red faced bear, dire wolves, saber tooth cats, and other animals. Um, and it's been rather tricky to figure out what happened to these guys. Um, there, there's really four competing hypotheses right now, although there are many more than that that have been proposed. One is that humans were responsible, the drivers of this, this extinction event through overhunting. This is called the overkill hypothesis. Because humans arrived in the New World just before 13,000 years ago, and then the animals go extinct shortly thereafter. The other um, possible culprit is climate change. This was a time of dramatic climatic change when the world was coming out of the ice age. The levels were warming or rising, the temperatures were, were warming, uh, ecological communities were reorganizing. Uh, another possible um, culprit is the hyper-disease hypothesis that proposes that humans, or possibly their domesticated animals, in this case dogs, brought with them pathogens to which a New World um, Pleistocene fauna had no prior exposure, a little resistance, and that some nasty disease wiped them out. Uh, and the final hypothesis is the extraterrestrial impact hypothesis, which is the newest um, uh, hypothesis to have been proposed, the idea that the new world was struck by a comet or an asteroid roughly around this time, causing the extinction of that. I'm afraid we're near the end of our time, but do you want to give just a spoiler <laughs> alert and, and tell us which of those explanations you favor? Sure. Yeah, I've been studying this a long time. Um, I used to be very skeptical of the idea that humans drove this event, but now I'm very much a believer in it in that idea that it was primarily human hunting and to give you a, maybe a 30 second answer why. In the earliest archaeological record of the New World, we have lots of, we, we have lots, we have evidence for hunting, human hunting of these extinct animals. But perhaps most damning, this pattern is repeated over and over again all across the world from Australia to various islands, North America, South America, Arctic Eurasia. Humans show up, large animals go extinct. Um, to me, that's a striking pattern that's hard to ignore. Mm, fair enough. Uh, we have one question that I think we just have time for. Can you tell us a little about how you prepare for your stints of field work in Mongolia? It's, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. <laughs> it's not so, a short answer, I know. Logistically, it's a difficult place to go to because to get into some of these camps, it's a three-day pack on horses. Mm. So, I have, so, for example, I live in Wyoming, but I'm not much of a cowboy, so I had to get familiar with, get comfortable with riding horses. I live in Wyoming, but I don't have guns, but I wanted to be comfortable around guns because I knew I'd be around guns, so I learned how to shoot. Uh, I have to plan enough food for two or three of us, depending on how many of us go. It all has to be packed in on horseback and it has to last for months. Uh, for this winter trip, I grew quite the beard. Uh, to insulate my face, and I was really happy <laughs> that I did. Mm. Um, clothing, uh, in the summertime, it rains a lot in northern Mongolia. You need really good waterproof clothing. You need great boots and multiple pairs of boots. Minimal clothing, but clothing that's easily washed and dried. Um, of course, I've, I've spent a lot of time learning the Mongolian language. Um, and, and first day, there's, there's many, many aspects to it. And if you're interested in, in, in hearing more about it, feel free to contact me. Uh, it's a complicated problem, but it's actually one of, one of the fun things about doing research and a hard to get to a place. So what would be words of wisdom that you might want to offer to young people thinking they might want to go into archaeology? Archaeology is for the person with the right kind of mentality, the person who likes to do somewhat tedious, repetitive tasks. Where you're talking about excavating archaeological site carefully or analyzing thousands of, of stone tools in the lab. The best way to find out whether you're one of those persons is to volunteer for an archaeological excavation. They're happening all the well, they're happening typically in the warm season. It depends where you are. If you live in a warm place, they happen year round. Um, volunteer for an archaeological dig, spend a week doing it, see how you feel about it. Um, that's the first thing I would do. Fair enough. Okay.
Well, I'm afraid our time is up. I'm sure our audience has other questions and you'll be getting follow-up questions sent along from us. Um, but for now, I just want to thank you for joining us. And uh, I think we've, you've given us a lot to think about. And to the audience here, thank you also for joining us. And thank you again to the RTP chapter for sponsoring this Google Hangout. Um, again, for the schedule of future Hangouts, um, please check our Google Plus page. Uh, thank you, Professor Surville. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.